You are listening to Pacifica Radio's Democracy Now! As economies around the world continue to plummet from Asia to Russia to Latin America, we bring you a speech by America's leading dissident, Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Well, I want to uh, at least mention uh, quite a number of different topics. Uh, the mentions are inevitably going to be far too brief. Uh, every one of them deserves intensive thought and discussion, and they're not at all comprehensive. But what I want to kind of suggest, if I can do it, is that these are some of the threads that ought to be uh, woven together to give some kind of coherent uh, picture of where we stand today, uh, what kinds of problems we have to face, and uh, where we might find at least a standpoint to begin to think about them in a constructive way. Uh, I want to go back a half a century. I think we live very much within an era that was more or less created then. Uh, there are occasional moments in human affairs uh, where power relations uh, make it possible to establish social and economic arrangements that actually merit the term uh, world order. Uh, merit might not be the right word. Uh, it's not necessarily a phrase that should be invested with uh, positive connotations, as history amply reveals. Uh, one of the most dramatic and, in fact, most easily timed of those moments was about 50 years ago uh, in the aftermath of the uh, most devastating single catastrophe in human history, uh, which took place right in the heartland of Western civilization. Uh, at the end of the war, the United States, of course, had an overwhelming share of global wealth and power, and perfectly naturally, uh, dominant forces within the state corporate nexus in the United States planned to use that power uh, to organize the world as much as they could uh, in accord with their own conceptions of uh, their interests and those they represented. Of course, there were conflicting visions, both at home and abroad, and they had to be contained or better uh, rolled back to borrow some Cold War rhetoric. Uh, that was done with varying degrees of success, but in fact the basic conflicts uh, persist, uh, and for elementary reasons, they persist because they're about fundamental values. Uh, they're about freedom, uh, justice, uh, human dignity, human rights. Uh, in a world of inequality, uh, great inequality and great concentration of power, the real world, that is, uh, these values quite commonly constitute an arena of conflict between centers of power and most of the rest. A good deal of history revol revolves around these conflicts in the last half century. There's no exception, and I'm sure the next will not be either. Well, at the onset of the current era, about half a century ago, the framers of the world order of that day, the new world order of that day, they faced these challenges everywhere. Uh, at home, what had to be contained, maybe rolled back, were the very strong commitments of a large majority of the population to social democratic ideals that the business world uh, rightly perceived as a grave threat to their traditional dominance. Uh, they were the hazard-facing industrialists in the rising political power of the masses, as the National Association of Manufacturers put it in their internal literature. Uh, it was the crisis of democracy that was posed by a population that sought to enter the political arena uh, as uh, frightened liberal inter internationalist elites phrased essentially the same problem uh, after the ferment of the 1960s, expressing particular concern about the what they called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, uh, which were failing to carry out their disciplining role properly. Uh, similar problems were faced throughout the industrial world. Uh, they were enhanced by the prestige and appeal of the anti-fascist resistance, which was a complex affair, but often had 
radical democratic thrusts. Uh, they were enhanced further by the discrediting of, traditional conserva of the traditional conservative order, which had been linked closely to the fascist system. Reinstating that traditional order in its essentials uh, was a primary task of the early post-war years, and it was achieved to a large extent, often in not very pretty ways. Uh, as in the United States, this project continues. It's taken new forms in the last 25 years, as here and as throughout the world, uh, under the guise of uh, neoliberalism or economic rationalism or free market doctrine, uh, which is permeated with a good deal of uh, deceit, uh, hypocrisy, maybe outright fraud. Uh, all of these issues are strongly, very, very much alive right now, here, Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, in the third world, um, the South, the developing world, as it's euphemistically called, uh, similar problems were compounded by strong pressures, uncontrollable pressures, to overturn the imperial systems and the legacy of dependency and subordination that they had left. Uh, the basic issues were very much the same in most of the world, but they're revealed with particular clarity, with starkest clarity, uh, in Latin America for the simple reason that the United States faced no challenge there, uh, no, no outside challenge. So you see the principles operating in their purest form. Uh, the only challenge was in the challenge, there was a real challenge, but it was from the domestic population. Uh, no outside challenge. Uh, as in Europe, uh, these conflicts in Latin America came to a head even before the war was over. Uh, in the case of Latin America, very dramatically in February 1945, um, at a hemispheric conference in uh, Canada was not part of the Western Hemisphere in those days, remember. So Western Hemisphere means the United States to the south. Uh, the uh, the uh, the hemispheric, I don't think Canada attended the conference, and maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, the uh, hemispheric conference was supposed to organize affairs of the hemisphere. Uh, we know from U.S. internal records now that the United States was deeply concerned with what the State Department called the philosophy of the new nationalism that was spreading all over Latin America, indeed all over the world, uh, quoting State Department documents. Uh, it, the philosophy of the new nationalism, which embraced policies designed to bring about a broader distribution of wealth and to raise the standard of living of the masses on the principle that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources uh, are the people of that country. Uh, that heresy is called uh, radical nationalism or economic nationalism, and of course it has to be stamped out. Uh, the first beneficiaries of a country's resources are U.S. investors, their counterparts elsewhere, and local elites who are associated with them. Uh, at the Hemispheric Conference, the United States, given the power relations, of course, the U.S. prevailed, uh, and it imposed uh, what was called an economic charter for the Americas, uh, which called for an end to economic nationalism in all its forms. Uh, in the cruel and bloody history uh, of the half century that followed, uh, these remain central themes, and they will continue to. They're very much alive today. Uh, now they're often framed differently in the context of the investor rights agreements that are mislabeled free trade agreements, uh, NAFTA, the forthcoming maybe multilateral agreement on investment, uh, MAI, and uh, the whole globalization, uh, what's called globalization, which is a specific form of international integration, not by any means the only necessary form. Uh, it's the specific form that's crafted primarily to serve the interests of its designers, again, not terribly surprisingly, uh, transnational corporations, financial institutions, and the bureaucracies that they control, and of course the major states that are part of the system. Uh, the most critical part of the Third World uh, was then, and I think remains today, the Middle East. 
for the very simple reason that it's the locus of the world's major energy supplies for as far ahead as anybody can see. Uh, hence, as it was considered to be and is still considered to be of particular importance that the first beneficiaries of those um, of that wealth uh, are not the people of the region, uh, uh, rather the, uh, uh, the resources must be under effective U.S. control, they must be accessible to the industrial world on terms that the United States leadership concedes appropriate, and crucially the huge profits that are generated uh, must flow primarily to the United States. Uh, secondarily to its British uh, junior partner, uh, to borrow the term used by the British Foreign Office rather roof ruefully uh, to describe its new role in the post-Second World War era. Uh, the, this is done in various ways. In part, it's recycled by local managers who have to be dependent on the global rulers, uh, long story which continues. Well, quite naturally, these arrangements uh, breed continual conflict. Uh, internal U.S. documents uh, describe them in the conventional way. The conflicts are conflicts with radical nationalism, radical Arab nationalism that threatens U.S. dominance. For the public, it's put a little differently, varying over time. Uh, these days, it's uh, international terrorism or the clash of civilization or tomorrow will be something new. Uh, these, but it's basically the same ones all the time. The question is, who's going to be the first beneficiaries of the region's resources? Uh, these uh, conflicts are likely to become more virulent than ominous in the coming years, at least if uh, the analysis and projection of quite a number of geologists are anywhere near accurate. Uh, the a reasonably broad consensus. There's plenty of room for disagreement and uncertainty, but a reasonably broad consensus was captured in a uh, in an in the headline of a major review article on the topic in the journal Science, the Journal of the American Association of Advancement of Science, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the headline was uh, "The Next Oil Crisis Looms Large and Perhaps Close." may be a little hard to believe in a period when gasoline prices are at historic low, but there are many who regard that as an aberration, short-term aberration. The crisis that many people fear uh, is that the rate of discovery has been declining for some time after having risen steadily since the this earliest discovery of oil. Uh, and uh, for some, um, the Gulf region, the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf region, uh, that has by now regained the share, or virtually regained the share of uh, energy production that it had in the early 1970s. You recall that that was sufficient uh, to bring uh, the era of super cheap uh, energy to a sudden uh, end, happened to be a temporary end, but uh, foretaste of what lies ahead. The, basically back to that share, meaning that degree of power, uh, and uh, that share is expected to increase uh, in part because world consumption is increasing very rapidly uh, and most of the known energy reserves by a long, by a big measure are in that region. Uh, and it's also speculated, not apparently not implausibly that something like the 50 percent uh, the mar the 50 percent mark of exploitable capacity may not be too far away maybe within the next few decades uh, all of this combines to suggest to policymakers and others that the need to control that region uh, is going to become increasingly important and that's going to mean very likely increasing confrontations with radical nationalism as a kind of a sidelight to this, uh, I think that very likely the latest uh, terrorist exchange the last few weeks might well be seen in this context. I'm referring to the terrorist bombings of the U.S. embassies in Africa, uh, allegedly by groups who are opposed to U.S. domination of the major oil producers and the U.S. missile attacks on Sudan and Afghanistan. And one might ask why those targets uh, 
well, like the bombings of the embassies in Africa, uh, the U.S. missile attack uh, was selected, uh, uh, it selected targets that were vulnerable, uh, not the ones to which the messages were aimed in either case. Uh, the message for the missile attacks may well have been directed elsewhere, in this case uh, very likely to Riyadh and Tehran. Uh, there have been recent steps towards rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, historic enemies. That's not an appealing prospect for U.S. global managers. Uh, it raises fears, which have been lingering for a long time, of regional groupings uh, that will get out of control in the strategically most important part of the world. Uh, which holds the greatest material prize in world history. It's quoting U.S. assessments from the late 40s, which still prevail. Uh, the U.S. missile attacks have been criticized. You've read plenty of criticisms of them as being counterproductive. Uh, elite opinion has held that counterproductive because of their effects on the Sudan and Afghanistan. Uh, well, uh, pragmatic judgment, apparently. Same opinion seems to be largely unconcerned by the fact that, uh, effective or not, uh, there were war crimes uh, that's now partially conceded in the case of Sudan. Uh, however, just keeping to the pragma pragmatic judgment, uh, it might be evaluated uh, in the light of a secret 1995 study of the U.S. Strategic Command called Essentials of Post-Cold War Deterrence, which was released recently under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, it's an interesting document. It resurrects uh, Nixon's madman theory, as it was called. Uh, it says that the United States should portray itself as irrational and vindictive, with leadership elements out of control, and it should exploit the nu nuclear arsenal for that purpose. This madman posture can be beneficial to creating and reinforcing fears and doubts among adversaries, real or potential. Uh, in this case, perhaps the big players in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, whose potential rapprochement, which has been going on now for almost a year, uh, is doubtless a very frightening prospect in Washington. Well, we don't have documentary evidence, so that's speculation, but I think it's not unreasonable. Well, there's a lot to say about all these topics. These are things I'm just mentioning. Uh, and related aspects of the post-war global system that I haven't even, I haven't even mentioned. Uh, but let me just leave it as something to think about and turn to something related, namely the institutional structures, the institutional framework that was designed for world order 50 years ago, uh, how it's fared, uh, what it looks like today. Uh, the institutional structure had three basic components. Uh, one was an international political order. That's articulated in the United Nations Charter. A second part was, uh, uh, was concerned with uh, human rights and the norms uh, for the behavior of governments uh, towards their citizens. That's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where its 50th anniversary will be celebrated or maybe mourned uh, in December 1998. Uh, the, uh, the third component was an international economic order. That's the Bretton Woods system, as it's called, designed by the United States and Great Britain, the global manager and the junior partner. Uh, I want to talk mostly about the third, but a few words about the first two. Uh, the first, the international political order, essentially the UN Charter, uh, that's based on a very simple, straightforward principle and elaborated in various ways. Uh, the principle is that uh, the threat or use of force in international affairs is uh, disallowed, unacceptable, has to be barred totally with two exceptions. Uh, one exception uh, is when the threat or use of force is specifically authorized by the Security Council after the Security Council determines that peaceful means have failed. Uh, the second is uh, the famous Art of Article 51, which says that nothing in this charter 
abrogates the right of self-defense against armed attack until the Security Council acts. That's a rather narrow and specific notion. It means, for example, that if uh, Cuban armies uh, invade the United States, uh, the United States is supposed to uh, notify the Security Council and uh, then until the Security Council has a chance to do something about this terrible threat, uh, it's allowed to defend itself uh, uh, in any way that's necessary. Uh, whether that example is hypothetical or not, you know, it depends on what you want to believe. Uh, the Cuban threat to the United States was recently downgraded by the Pentagon so we don't have to tremble in total fear anymore, uh, that elicited a good deal of anger in Congress, and uh, the conclusion was rejected by the White House, uh, which appealed to the, which invoked the national, the threat, uh, Cuba's threat to the national security and existence of the United States uh, just a few months ago, uh, in the course of rejecting World Trade Organization jurisdiction uh, when the European Union uh, protested before the WTO uh, gross U.S. violations of trade agreements and international law that had already been condemned by just about every international agency, uh, including even the normally quite compliant Organization of American States. So depending on where you sit, that example was real or hypothetical, uh, but whatever it is, uh, that's the exception permitted by the uh, U.N. Charter, by the framework of, inter of uh, political order and international, received international law. Uh, the, uh, those are the only exceptions to the threat or use of force. Now, of course, there's no enfor enforcement mechanism. Uh, this has to be by acceptance. Uh, the only, there is, in fact, an enforcement mechanism, namely the great powers, and to be realistic, exactly one of them, namely the United States. So that's the enforcement mechanism. But that suffices to show that the whole system is null and void uh, because the United States rejects the principles out of hand. Uh, it uh, rejects them both in practice and, in fact, in doctrine. Uh, there's no need to waste time on the practice in the past half century, uh, the bombing of a uh, pharmaceutical plant in the Sudan a couple of weeks ago is a recent illustration, but one that's completely trivial in historical context, though I suppose that uh, terrorist destruction of half of the uh, uh, medical uh, supplies and fertilizers in the United States might be taken a shade more seriously. Uh, whatever the practice may be, and you can know that perfectly well or should, uh, what's interesting about the recent years is that official doctrine expresses with great clarity and precision uh, the utter contempt for the principles of world order that are, of course, grandly proclaimed uh, when they serve some power interest. This has been going on since the Reagan years, and it is a change. Uh, since the Reagan, a, ch a doctrinal change. Since, you might say, it's a change towards greater honesty. Anyhow, it's a change. Uh, the, since the Reagan years, the United States has officially uh, reinterpreted the uh, Article 51, the crucial article, uh, uh, to justify its repeated reliance on force. Uh, it has held that Article 51, author I'm quoting actually, Article 51 authorizes self-defense against future attack. Uh, Article 51 permits the United States to defend its interests. Uh, this even became even more ludicrous in the Clinton years. Uh, it was all formulated rather straightforwardly by uh, Ambassador Albright, now Secretary of State, when she informed the UN Security Council, which was then refusing to go along with some US demands about Iraq, uh, she informed the Security Council that the United States will act multilaterally when we can, unilaterally when we must, uh, in an area important for our interests. Uh, that un means unconstrained by the world court, which had already been dismissed as irrelevant ten years earlier, uh, by the most solemn treaty obligations, uh, the foundations of world order, and so on. I stress that the only innovation in all of this in the past 15 years uh, is that contempt for these high principles is now openly proclaimed 
with the acquiescence and the applause of the educated classes. That's a change. Uh, but it serves to indicate where the foundations of world order stand after 50 years. In brief, the United Nations and its charter uh, are fine when they serve as an instrument of power. Otherwise, the decisions and the condemnations uh, don't even, uh, they're not even worth reporting and they are not reported, uh, let alone obeying. Uh, incidentally, there's, you've been following, I'm sure, the recent debate about founding an international criminal court uh, on war crimes. And as you know, the United States essentially alone, I mean, a few minor powers, uh, the United States is essentially alone uh, refused to uh, go along with that. Uh, U.S. opposition is effectively a veto uh, when the General Assembly votes, uh, you know, 151 to 1 on something or two if the U.S. picks up a client state, that amounts to a veto, just for straight power reasons, nothing obscure about it. Uh, and this effectively vetoes the criminal court of, on war crimes. The official argument that was given was by the Clinton administration and Congress was that uh, uh, an international tribunal might, bring, uh, might uh, carry out frivolous uh, prosecution of U.S. soldiers engaged in peacekeeping operations. That's not very credible, especially if you look at the U.S. role. The U.S. is mostly disqualified from peacekeeping operations. Uh, that's literally true. Uh, the reason is because it has a very unusual, maybe unique military doctrine, and that is that no uh, military forces are permitted to come under any threat. So if there's any threat at all, you're supposed to react with overwhelming force. And that means that in any situation that involves civilians or, you know, anything short of total war, uh, the U.S. military simply can't be deployed, and in fact isn't if you look at the peacekeeping operations. So that's not a plausible uh, uh, argument, but there are other ones that are plausible and are barely beneath the surface, surface. Uh, and that is the very likely concern that an independent judicial inquiry, if it existed, uh, cut, might, as, as it should, move up the chain of command, and that's going to lead it very soon to pretty high places, including the White House. Uh, that would be true whether the issue is Indochina or Central America and Panama or Somalia or other exploits. But let's turn to the second element of wor world order, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, you will doubtless, we will all hear much rhetoric in the coming months about the universality uh, of the high principles that are proclaimed and about the challenge of relativity that's posed by various bad guys around the world. Uh, those charges uh, will be accurate enough, unfortunately, uh, but and probably understated. Uh, but you're unlikely to hear about a different topic, namely U.S. adherence to the Universal Declaration, both in action and in doctrine. Well, again, I'll put aside action and just keep to the doctrine. Uh, if you look at the doctrine, you find out quickly that the United States is a leader of the relativist camp. Um, one is unlikely to see headlines about that, uh, but it's pretty clear. The United States dismisses one fundamental component of the Universal Declaration completely as having no status. That's the uh, component that's concerned with socioeconomic, uh, the socioeconomic provisions, which have the same status as any others in the Universal Declaration, but the U.S. doesn't agree. Uh, they are uh, a letter to Santa Claus, as Ambassador Gene Kirkpatrick put it. Uh, they are preposterous and a dangerous incitement as they were described by U.S. Ambassador Morris Abrams. Uh, he was, in fact, testifying at the discussing part of the discussion of the U.N. Commission on Human Rights, which was considering a declaration of, on the right of development, which very closely paraphrased the socioeconomic uh, conditions of the Universal Declaration, and which, incidentally, the U.S. proceeded to veto. Uh, well, again, there's more to say. But let's proceed to the third point, the international economic order. Uh, the Bretton Woods system, as it's called, and its institutions, that's all over the front pages right now uh, with the fears of a global meltdown that might affect uh, privileged folk like us, uh, as well as just the usual victims. So therefore, it's news. Uh, well, the uh, Bretton Woods 
system had two basic principles set up institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, but it, uh, had, which are called the Bretton Woods institutions, but it had two basic principles which one has to keep in mind. They're important. One principle was uh, to liberalize trade. A goal was to liberalize trade, more free trade. Uh, the second principle had to do with capital flow, and it was the opposite. The goal was to regulate capital flow and control it, keep fixed exchange rates, keep capital controls, and so on. Uh, that was agreed by both the U.S. and the British negotiators. The U.S. negotiator, main negotiator, was Harry Dexter White, British John Maynard Keynes, uh, and it expressed a very common conception at the time, which has a lot of plausibility. Uh, it's built into the rules of the IMF. So up till this, there's now an effort, U.S. is leading an effort to try to change those rules. But up until now, although they've been breached many times, the rules of the IMF still uh, authorize countries to uh, regulate capital flow, and they prohibit the IMF from giving credits uh, to cover capital flight. Uh, any of you who follow these affairs will know how well that one's been observed. Uh, anyhow, it is a rule. Uh, well, there was a there was thinking behind this. Uh, there were reasons. Uh, the reasons were in part theory, uh, what some international economists call an incompatibility thesis, uh, which in fact remains the guiding principle of uh, UNCTAD, the main UN you know, commission conference. It's called on trade and development. Uh, the, uh, the, th the theory is that uh, um, capital flight so short-term speculative flows, uh, lead to exchange rate fluctuations, and so on, that they're going to undermine trade. Uh, they're going to undermine uh, trade and investment. So they're inconsistent with one another. Can't liberalize both. And recent experience is, I think, consistent with that uh, assumption. Uh, the second reason was not a theory. It was a truism. Uh, the truism is that free flow of capital definitely undermines democracy and the welfare state. Uh, which was at that time far too popular uh, to ignore. It's the mid-20th century. Uh, the basic point, I'm essentially paraphrasing White and Keynes here, the basic point is that capital controls allow governments to carry out monetary and tax policies to sustain unemployment, uh, incomes, social programs, maintain public goods, uh, without fear of capital flight, which will punish uh, this uh, irrational behavior, irrational in that it's only for the benefit of people, not for the benefit of investors and speculators, and it will be punished by capital flight for obvious reasons. Uh, the, uh, uh, so capital, uh, that's the essential point. Uh, free flow of capital quickly creates what some international economists call a virtual senate of financial capital, which will impose its own social policies uh, by the threat of uh, capital flight, which leads to higher interest rates, uh, it, uh, economic slowdown, uh, budget cuts for health and education, uh, recession, maybe collapse. It's a powerful weapon. Uh, all of that was articulated quite explicitly, and essentially the words I've used repeated, at the time by the U.S.-U.K. negotiators, and it's not particularly controversial. In fact, not controversial at all then or now. If you think it through, it's kind of obvious, as it was to them. And all of that is quite important to keep in mind in looking at the current period, because there's a challenge to that in the last 25 years, and we see the consequences. Uh, the, uh, and it's now being reevaluated because the consequences are even hitting the rich people. That's where we are right now. Well, the Bretton Woods system, as formulated, that is, efforts to liberalize trade and regulate capital, uh, that was in place. It, it was never, you know, there were always discrepancies and so on. But in, in, a, in essence, it was in place in a substantial, to a substantial degree through what is through the first half of this period, first quarter century after it was established. Uh, that's what's sometimes called the golden age of post-war state capitalism. Uh, high rates of growth of the economy, of productivity, expansion of the social contract right through the 50s and the 60s. Uh, the system was dismantled from the early 1970s uh, 
Richard Nixon um, unilaterally abrogated its basic principles. Other major financial centers joined in. Uh, by the 1980s, uh, capital controls were mostly gone in the rich countries. Uh, and the smaller economies, like South Korea, were simply compelled to drop them. Uh, that, incidentally, is widely regarded now as a major factor in its recent collapse uh, alongside of quite extreme uh, market failures in the private sector throughout East and Southeast Asia and of also the West, which was involved in crazed lending. Uh, I should add at this point that in the light of the recent uh, economic crisis in East Asia, that the more serious analysts uh, recognize and insist that the East Asian economic miracle was quite real. I'm distinguishing East Asia from Southeast Asia here. They're quite different. Uh, so one of the most important and influential and I think intelligent, Joseph Stiglitz, who's now the chief economist of the World Bank, he was formerly head of Council of Economic Advisors here, and it plays a very important role. Uh, he emphasizes in recent World Bank publications and elsewhere that this is post-crisis, that the East Asian uh, economic miracle was not only real, but it was, in his words, an amazing achievement, uh, historically without precedent, and furthermore, he points out, based on very significant departures from the official doctrines, so-called Washington Consensus, uh, and that it should, uh, uh, should last, it should thrive, in fact, unless it's destroyed by uh, irrational financial markets, as it could be. Uh, Stiglitz points out, remember, this is the chief economist of the World Bank I'm talking about in World Bank publications, uh, that in East Asia, the basis for the amazing achievements and the miracle, uh, which has no precedent, uh, is that uh, governments took major responsibility for the promotion of economic growth, abandoning the religion that markets know best uh, and intervening to enhance technology transfer, relative equality, education, health, uh, along with, um, he doesn't stress this, but he should have, along with industrial planning and coordination, and in fact strict capital controls until they were forced to relinquish them in the last few years. Uh, Stiglitz also mentions, though he doesn't go into it, uh, that the rich countries, every one of them, from England on through the United States up to the present, every single one of them had followed a somewhat similar path, actually far more so than the World Bank has yet acknowledged. Another big topic I can't go into, but an interesting one. Well, again, worth keeping in mind. Well, what has happened since the system, the Bretton Woods system, essentially collapsed in the early 1970s? It did end the golden age of uh, post-war state capitalism. Just focusing on the rich countries, primarily the United States and Britain, although others, happens to others in various degrees in an integrated economy. Uh, over the rich countries as a whole, uh, the growth of the economy and the growth of productivity have slowed very markedly. Uh, actually, contrary to what you read, trade also slowed, if you look closely, uh, in the United States specifically and England. Uh, incomes stagnated or declined throughout this period for the great majority of the population. Uh, working conditions deteriorated. Uh, social services have been significantly cut. Uh, infrastructure has, uh, is in serious danger with very little uh, required public spending. Uh, the welfare state has significantly eroded. Uh, there has also been a closely correlated a dramatic increase in incarceration. It's closely car correlated because a large part of the society is just becoming superfluous for wealth formation. Uh, in an uncivilized society, you send out the death squads to kill them. In a civilized society, you throw them in jail. Uh, the, uh, since 1980, when the system really took shape, took, you know, was in place, uh, at that time, incarceration rates in the United States were roughly like other industrial countries, kind of at the high end, but not off the scale. And so, like, crime rates in the United States are not unusually high, contrary to what you read. I mean, again, sort of toward the high end, but not unusual, with one exception, uh, namely killing with guns, but that's a separate matter. It has to do with laws, 
cultural pattern and so on that have anything to do with crime. The, uh, uh, and that remains the case. In fact, crime rates have declined since 1980. But the um, uh, incarceration has gone way up. It's a reflection of the, I think it's a direct reflection of the inequality and the need for social control. Uh, it tripled in the 1980s. It's been rising very fast through the 1990s. Uh, it's now five to ten times as high as other industrial societies. In fact, the U.S. is world champion in uh, imprisoning its population, at least among countries where there's any minimally reliable statistics. Uh, if you take the prison population into account, that adds another 2% uh, to the unemployment rate, which places the U.S. squarely in the middle of the European level. Actually, even without that, it's not at the bottom, believe it or not. It's about 30%. Of course, this requires a little... You know, I have to decide what you're talking about. If you count in prison labor, uh, which is not trivial and very good for folks like Boeing Aircraft and AT&T and others, terrific workforce, uh, if you count them in, well, then, of course, the unemployment figures change again. Uh, high borrowing, high, highly leveraged uh, character of investment, which is something new, incidentally. A lot of things are old, but this is new. Uh, that's accelerating... Um, the uh, irrationality of markets. They've become financial markets. They've become much more volatile and unpredictable. There have been wildly fluctuating exchange rates uh, related to speculative flows, and there have been increasing financial crises. Uh, the IMF really recently did a study of the period 1980 to 1995, 15-year period, and it found that about 80 percent of its roughly 180 members had had one or more banking crises, uh, ranging from significant to quite serious. Uh, uh, again, that wouldn't have surprised Keynes and White or any of the framers of Bretton Woods or the economists or the thinking behind them. The same period, again in conformity with their thinking, has been uh, an assault, an attack on free markets, a, a sustained assault on free markets, to quote the head of economic research of the World Trade Organization in a major technical study. Uh, that was led by the Reaganites. Uh, they were talking free markets for the poor, but doing something else for the rich. Uh, he, this analyst, Patrick Lowe, estimates the effect of Reaganite protectionist measures at about three times as high as those of the other industrial countries, which were bad enough. Uh, well, again, that's what was expected. Uh, during the Reagan years, uh, uh, lots of lofty rhetoric, but protection was essentially virtually doubled. Uh, the public subsidy, which is another violation of free trade principle, was increased. Uh, bailouts increased, both for say, domestic banks, international banks. Uh, the, in the United States, it's, it's happened throughout the world, but mostly in the United States. In the United States, the goal was to uh, uh, somehow overcome uh, very serious management failures uh, that were leading to a decline of U.S. industry uh, and, and were a matter of great concern at the time. Uh, all of this continues under Clinton alongside the free market rhetoric. Uh, radical interference with free trade is standard when convenient. Professor Noam Chomsky speaking in June 1998 at the University of Calgary in Canada. 